And there is a unite, another important quality that birds represent to me. That is beauty. I think of them as among nature's masterpieces. There have been so many moments in my experience when I have stood utterly rapt at the sheer loveliness of birds, at the way a hooded warbler's face glows from its black hood, or the way a painted bunting seems to carry every color of the rainbow in its plumage. In the years I taught bird classes for Audubon in the New York City public schools, the most meaningful moments were those when children raised in tough neighborhoods among pigeons, house sparrows, and starlings underwent a metamorphosis similar to mine as they opened their eyes and hearts to the unexpected loveliness of blue jays, great blue herons, and Baltimore Orioles in Central Park, witnessing again and again their sense of discovery and delight. I couldn't help but think that if we all came to know and really see and begin to understand these natural works of art, our inner reservoirs of wonder, appreciation, harmony, beauty, joy, peace, would expand and deepen and bless one another and our planet. Our world needs beauty. It needs affirmations of life. It needs winged thought. Migratory birds represent these qualities. Year after year, century after century, they have brought beauty, vitality, dynamic movement to this planet. But they need advocates. Their homes, their winter and summer habitats, and the important refueling spots like the CNO Corridor and Rock Creek Park are not always guaranteed. On their twice yearly migratory journeys, they face the threat not only of dwindling habitat, but windows, cell towers, nightlit buildings, trapping for caged bird trade, insecticide poisons, predatory cats, and more recently, man induced climate change. Since the years I was here in the early 70s, there has been a steady decline for many species of migratory songbirds. The wood thrush, which many of you are wearing on your um, name tags, is one example. At a meeting of the Cornell Laboratory, uh, Lab of Ornithology last week, I learned that data collected over five decades shows that the species has declined by over 50% since the 60s. The bobolink, also on some of your name tags, has fared even worse. Its numbers have plummeted by over 90% in the same time frame. I don't intend to end on a discordant note. I am by nature hopeful. I've worked for over 20 years on grassland restorations in my home state of Illinois, and I'm wonderfully encouraged by the return of bobolinks, Henslow sparrows, and other declining grassland species to restored habitat. But I also don't want to minimize the need that migratory birds and other species have for thoughtful advocacy and action. Air, water, forest, marshlands know no political boundaries, and neither do migratory birds. They need protective attention at both ends of their migratory routes and all along the way. Though bobolinks may find increased breeding habitat and prairie restorations, that will not matter much if they face crops laced with DDT and other pesticides in their wintering grounds. Conversely, while pintails and other waterfowl may enjoy sufficient wintering habitat, the destruction of wetlands in North America will signal their decline. I am forever grateful to my early tutors for the awakening that I experienced to the beauty, complexity, diversity, and dynamics of birds and subsequently to the wider natural world. It was only a next logical step to feel a desire to help those species continue to flourish, to maintain their unique and irreplaceable niche in the natural order. As an individual dedicated to the protection and stewardship of wild species and landscapes, I appreciate and salute the constructive and critical role played by the Congressional International Conservation Caucus and the International Conservation Caucus Foundation. I feel hopeful that as we all, individually and collectively, work as advocates and ambassadors and activists in support of international conservation efforts, today's children and their grandchildren will inherit a world where tropical and temperate landscapes continue to host wood thrushes, bobolinks, western tanagers, and where they also can watch and learn and wonder at the diversity of life on Earth. And I thought before, we get to Alberto, that we would just do a quick run through, kind of a virtual um, greeting line, if you don't mind, <laughs> just a visual one, if, it, if we have time. Do we have time to do that? Okay, um, so many of you have the wood thrush. This is a great species that winters in Central America that um, continues to th live in, in uh, breed in many of the ravines in Rock Creek Park. Here we go, I forgot about this. See, see if this works. Um, you said there was a delay, so. 
maybe I, you know, here we go, the, the bobolink. Um, one of my favorites, the, the Midwesterners among you probably have bobolinks on your tags and may have the plush toy. Um, one of the really wonderful long distance flyers. Yeah, you can play the bobolink. <laughs> Spinks, bang, spinks, spinks, spinks. Um, the uh, the grassland uh, breeder uh, down by so such great numbers, but as I said, beginning to come back with with grassland restorations. Uh, the western tanager for those of you um, in, from western habitats, a mountain bird. And I just had an email and photograph from one of my best friends in Colorado the other day that she took of a western tanager that just had arrived outside her kitchen window. Barn swallow. These nest in the Washington area. Um, they are one of the great. They have a huge range um, throughout almost all of Central America and throughout North America. If you walk across the bridge at Teddy Roosevelt Island, you'll see, you're guaranteed to see barn swallows swooping uh, beneath you. Uh, the peregrine falcon, one of the birds that was very critical or very uh, important in, in my own awakening to the bird world. Um, just a magnificent raptor, the fastest uh, clocked species on Earth that dives at more than 200 miles an hour. And the wonderful scarlet tanager, a cousin of the Western tanager, but it's an, it's an eastern counterpart that we actually see here in the Washington area, and it does breed here. So it's, you have a good chance of seeing scarlet tanagers in this area. Um, the rose-breasted grosbeak, um, related to the cardinal, you can tell by that big fat bill. Again, a uh, winter in, the, in Central America and um, Northern South America. Um, the wonderful Baltimore Oriole, named for the vestments of Lord Baltimore, <laughs> those orange and black. Um, duds that it wears, and uh, one of the most beautiful, weaver of the most beautiful nests. They make these wonderful uh, pouch-shaped nests and breeds quite abundantly. The, one of the best places to see them is at the Great Falls Visitor's Tavern along the CNO Canal. Uh, for those in the west, the um, yellow-headed blackbird, a breeder of marshes. And I always think of its call as like a uh, trumpeter that suddenly got into age stage fright. It was going, Indigo bunting, um, just a, almost an indescribable blue, uh, fairly common in the, in the Washington area, particularly outside the city in, in uh, grasslands. And it's, this is the one that I mentioned that carries the, all the colors of the rainbow, the painted bunting. A bird that is actually threatened a lot by the captive bird trade. It's, it's, it's trapped um, for, as pets and um, just a beautiful species. And my, one of my favorite warblers, the hooded warbler, because one nests uh, in near my home in Illinois, um, and they're just uh, wonderful, wonderful warblers. These are the little neotropical migrant warblers, and these are the half-ounce ones. We're down to half-ounce birds that travel thousands of miles every year. The black-throated blue warbler, <coughs> oh, it's been working just fine. There we go. The little oven bird, the teacher, 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 teacher. If you're walking in Rock Creek Park, they're actually nesting right now. They waddle there. It's a it's a ground warbler. The um, black pole warbler, which holds the one of the long distance flying records, it goes down as far as northern, um, well, I guess Brazil, um, so maybe Argentina, but, but thousand six thousand miles. <laughs> this little thing that if somebody calculated, if you were to transfer the energy use into miles per gallon, it gets seven hundred and fifty thousand miles to the gallon. <laughs> <laughs> and the black Bernian warbler with its flame throated colors, oh, just, I mean, I just figure if somebody sees that bird, they're going to love birding forever. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> and then the last one, the little ruby-throated hummingbird, which um, also nests in the area, this little dynamo that, that's, that crosses the Gulf of Mexico 600 miles nonstop, you know, along with many, but it's just so, um, such a jewel. So thank you very much, and I think, John, you're going to introduce Alberto.